solar flares around the edge of the uh, corona, the solar corona. Yay. Um, hi, everybody. This is the OGM, or Open Global Mind, weekly call for Thursday, May 8th, 2024. Uh, we have as our topic today, what are you doing with Gen AI? Uh, in particular, Marshall raised a really interesting question on the OGM list, which was about local LLMs, and just shared with us a video by a little company called Nose Research um, that explains the, the concept really well. It's like, if you want to be um, not detected by and uh, you want your exhaust data not fed into the jaws of the machine, uh, maybe you could do this on your own. So um, hoping we just sort of, I think maybe we start there. I, I don't know if anybody had a chance to watch this, a three minute video, it's really quite good. Um, awesome, looks like a lot of people got to see it. Marshall, your timing is impeccable. It, it's uh, very slick. It's got all the buzzwords strung together very craftily with great graphics. But I haven't used end, it yet. At the end, it's quite lyrical. I, uh, I, lyrical is a good, it, it's very, I mean, I, AI made human. I mean, that's, if you can imprint that in your head, then that's a good buzzword. But it's a, it's a real product with thousands or tens of thousands of people using it. Yeah, I, uh, yeah it's. I don't, uh, I, the email that you sent us in, Marshall, can you send it again? It was on the OGM list, Gil. You're getting only the summary, so you're not. You didn't. Oh, it, he sent um, it. He sent it uh, a half hour before the, this call. Got so, it. I'll go. Um, I'll pick it out. Thank you. You, you don't um, need to do that. We will paste it into the chat in a second. Okay. Yep, I can drop it in right here. And cool. uh, thanks, Marshall. Yeah, there's a link to that that video from News Hermes, uh, open source project distributed around the world. Uh, one of the most one of the most powerful fine tunings of I believe, if memory serves me correctly, they're fine-tuning Meta's Llama models. Uh, but there are are so many so many different models out there, um, and uh, I I wanted to to wanted to uh, ask about and uh, participate in a conversation uh, about different ways to use those different models, especially locally. And uh, and so uh, Jerry, I I um, I'd be I, I'd love to to share some of my experience and thoughts briefly uh, to initiate that conversation. I invited some friends uh, here as well that I'm so glad had this uh, opportunity to to connect with OGM. Uh, but uh, Jerry's or how's that sound to you? Is there anything more you want to say before I I do that? I think kick us off, and I think uh, that'll take us someplace naturally. And afterward, uh, you know, a bunch of people in OGM have been using uh, BPTs or LLMs in different ways, and we can kind of share experiences. But I think that's a really great starting point. Cool. Uh, do you mind if I share my screen to show a couple things, Jerry? Not what? Not remotely. Right on. Cool. So, so folks, uh, I have, uh, for context on this conversation. Uh, I responded to uh, to Gill's uh, thread started on this Bellingcat uh, article on the seven deadly sins of bad open source research. It's a really good article. Uh, let's see, is oh, did I lose my uh, example, my mind map uh, of it? Uh, I was going to show you a little mind map uh, of this article uh, built by Cohere, uh, one of my favorite. It looks like it's generating it now. Yeah. Um, and then Klaus uh, jumped into the thread and said, this raises concerns about who controls your AI, uh, your GPT. Uh, there's a, a nice little mind map of that, that article. Uh, and I said, speaking of uh, who controls your AI, that makes me uh, want to participate in a conversation about uh, running open source AIs locally. Uh, and Jerry said, let's talk about it on the OGM call. So I, uh, my name is Marshall Kirkpatrick, and I, I don't get to participate in OGM calls nearly as often as I'd like to. Uh, I have a handful of times uh, over the years, but um, for those I don't know, you know, I, I'm a guy who's participated now in every stage of the startup journey, really, uh, from journalist to founder to executive through an IPO to most recently working in venture capital. 
And as I was telling Jerry, uh, as of a couple of weeks ago, I'm a free agent uh, for the first time in, in years. And I'm really, really excited about that. And it enables me to do things like come and participate in, uh, in a call like this. And uh, I invited some friends that uh, I, I'm excited to connect with OGM as well. Uh, we've got folks like uh, Justin and Jason are here who uh, train leaders in onboarding in the use of uh, AI. Uh, I went to one of their sessions yesterday and it was great. Uh, Alexandra is here who writes in uh, the Wall Street Journal about personal use of AI uh, with some really inspiring like life hacks and professional hacks. Uh, Maria is here who leads one of the, the world's most awesome research teams at Exponential View uh, where they use AI a lot and write about AI a lot. Uh, and then my friend Christopher, I invited as well. Hopefully he'll, uh, I'm not sure if he, he's here uh, yet. Yes. He, oh, wonderful. Good. So Christopher works on embodiment, co-creation, and integration uh, at a project called the Residence Building and uses AI a, a lot for that. So I, I uh, you know, I I use ChatGPT a lot Um as I bet a lot of folks here do, uh, but it was when I was watching this video from News Hermes uh, or News Research about six months ago that really I got to thinking, huh, maybe I should take this open source and and local AI thing a, a little bit more seriously. Um, I, I like the way they talk about uh, humans and AI dancing towards mutual self-improvement uh, together. Uh, but there's all kinds of different reasons why you'd want to, and I'll share a, a couple of those. Uh, but, you know, I, in addition to ChatGPT, I mean, there's there's nothing that can beat its mobile app, especially its read aloud function and all kinds of stuff uh, in my, my experience. But if you want to try uh, other uh, tools, one of my favorites is Poe uh, that lets you come in and uh, choose between all kinds of cool new models. Um, including uh, the very the very powerful uh, Llama 370B over on the Grok server that uh, is super fast. And uh, so that's a cool way to explore uh, open source models. Another uh, that's fun is uh, that I wanted to share is the Limsys uh, chatbot arena, where uh, here, for example, I took the uh, transcript of Jerry's introduction on YouTube to OGM. Um, and I put it in here and I said, uh, please reflect on this introduction uh, for a prospective participant in OGM in terms of historical precedents and social justice concerns. Oh, and logistical uh, perspectives. And it went out and asked uh, two different open source models. I guess they're not just open source, two different models uh, to respond. And then I can come in and say, you know what? I think B is better, actually. I like uh, the one over there. And it says, oh, guess what? That was the, oh, wow, the hot new, I'm a good GPT chatbot, the mystery one that is rumored to be GPT-5. Uh, and it beat uh, Quinn uh, from the Alibaba team in China uh, in, in this little blind taste test uh, that I did. And so now I'm among uh, the uh, now 1 million plus total votes in uh, blind taste tests uh, where people have gone through and said, this is the model I prefer. Uh, so you can see GPT-4 Turbo is uh, is currently leading in the uh, blind taste test. So lots of different ways to uh, to test out different models uh, that I, I wanted to share. Uh, but the oh, how did I get my uh, there we go. Uh, but uh, locally. You know, I, I'm not a developer, and so, and I don't feel as comfortable in the command line as I, I might like. Uh, I I like a UI, and on a Mac, uh, this system, uh, LM Studio, is uh, is my tool of choice. It's super easy to use. Uh, built by a little five person team in Brooklyn, uh, led by a former Apple engineer, and. Uh, the way that it works is you come in and you can search for uh, or choose from the menu of all these different open source. There's Hermes uh, version of, of Mistral 7B. Uh, there's Google's model and you download these models onto your local machine uh, and then you can chat uh, with them. So um, you load up these models and, uh, and then you can come in and chat uh, as 
as you would uh, online with a chat GPT, but it's entirely offline. Uh, and there's some cool, you know, various things about it. Uh, one of my favorite uh, parts of the capabilities here is that it's really easy to manage a, um, a system prompt. And so, you know, now, right now, every prompt that I'm sending, uh, well, I'm not sending it anywhere, but I guess I'm sending it to this application, is using uh, Meta's Llama 3 uh, 7B model. That's the biggest model I can run on my little MacBook Air here. Um, and it's sending this uh, system prompt. I added the stand to the standard system prompt, uh, my uh, my five strengths in the Clifton Strengths Finder, um, and saying that uh, one of my top priorities in life right now is nervous system regulation, and uh, <laughs> sometimes it, it that is particularly relevant, and I forget that I even say it. Uh, so I was asking about a, an interpersonal matter with my wife the other day, which I feel comfortable doing on a local device. Wouldn't send it over to ChatGPT, and it said, yeah, given those strengths of yours that you've identified. Uh, here's something. And I was like, oh my goodness, my therapist hasn't told me that. I haven't thought about that. That's a great, uh, that's a great point. Um, so that vulnerability is, is really cool. Um, so there's a couple of reasons why you'd want to do this. Yes. Marshall, just a, a, a thought. You're going, you're going really quickly through a lot of stuff that I think, uh, three quarters of which is probably new to a bunch of people on the call. Thing. So I'm wondering if you want to pause for a second for a couple of questions, Great. For whoever's there, uh, and we can catch up with you and then keep going because this is awesome. Cool. Um, so anybody with questions, please just uncloak and uh, chime in. Our clarification on anything, no question too dumb. I'd, I'd rather have Marshall blast along for a while longer uh, to have more of a context for questions, but other people may disagree. Sounds great. And if nobody's just stepping in with questions, I will pass the con back to Marshall. I have a quick question. I apologize. Um, that might be relevant. Marshall, one of the benefits of localized open source, like you said, is it's not passing information back to large corporations. Is this data being saved anywhere? Um, is it, or is it just purely on your local drive? There's no, uh, yeah, it's everything is completely local. There's no internet pinging at all. Is that correct? Yes, to my knowledge, uh, that is the case. And that, that's pretty fundamental to the value proposition of some of these systems. Um, I mean, I, I haven't turned off my Wi-Fi and used it, but uh, that, you know, use it on a plane, use it, you know, without plane Wi-Fi. Um, that's, yeah, that uh, that's core to uh, to the value proposition. Whether you trust this little startup, you know, uh, it might be another matter, but um, yes. And and that seems to be the principal value proposition is privacy, agency, uh, autonomy. Um, for if, if you trusted the the machines and the networks entirely, you would just always want to have a connection and go to the bigger to the bigger models, or no? Well, not yeah, not necessarily. Uh, the one of the reasons why I pulled this up is that uh, the. The open source models are are quickly approaching parity. Um, this chart was from like six months ago, and uh, and now uh, Llama three is uh, right about it, it's just above the the Yi line from Kai Fu Li uh, in China, and it is real close to the the state of the art of uh, of GPT four. Now this I'm a I'm a GPT. But two uh, mystery model uh, might be a, a, a little bump up, uh, but uh, yeah, performance wise, um, there. I'll tell you, some of these open source models are more than good enough for me uh, in terms of their their inference quality. So some of the the there is. Uh, yeah, I mean, GPT-4 uh, still, you know, it, it is the best, um, and uh, but it's uh, it's real close. I, I but I I do like the uh, the local uh, the local control and the privacy but for folks who are are concerned about security, perhaps regulatory compliance uh, or data uh, ownership. Um, that's uh, that's a, a, a consideration for a lot of folks. For me, I think the thing that moves me most is uh, politics and trust. 
you know, I, I read once uh, somewhere, and Jerry, I know you've got so much thinking on this, but I, I read somewhere that that trust means being able to take what's most precious to you, hand it to someone, uh, and and really believe that they're going to treat it with care and respect. And when I think about Sam Altman and and uh, OpenAI, mm -hmm. uh, I do not feel that way. Uh, so many of these, you know, some people complain that the the AI platforms are too woke. Uh, like maybe they're a little controlling in the safety stuff, I suppose. But my concern is way more uh, that they are super conservative. Um, I mean, they think DEI is a waste of breath. And uh, like coming from an eco-feminist perspective, they'll like explicitly like call some of that stuff. When I think about Mark Andreessen's recent screed, um uh, it just it makes me think uh i would like to run my ai locally thank you uh, um so. Uh, so just a just a brief reflection on the mega billionaires who are in charge of all the systems that we depend on so much is a very sobering snap back to why this might be a great thing so thank you for that and it's interesting also to see how how well the yama and open source uh models are actually moving that that's pretty amazing totally i i'm i'm real Real impressed with it. And the last couple of considerations I'll share is that, uh, you know, especially as the the world at large comes online and starts participating in all this, um, the the future isn't going to cost twenty dollars a month. Uh, I think that that uh, that the participating in the the free local open source uh, you know, movement around this is going to help help us uh, participate with uh, with folks with far less expendable income. Um, and the uh, it, it just it just feels cool. Uh, and I, I trust it more. You know, I I in uh, LM sys there, uh, I put in my system prompt and I said, here's what I'd like you to know about me. Chat GPT has a new memory feature where it'll just grab things that you said to it and add it to the system prompt. Uh, and you can remove those things. But the other day when uh, when it was answering to me and it said, uh, remember how you had watched a, an episode of Grey's Anatomy recently? Well, this is kind of like that. I thought, hey, now I didn't tell you to remember that I watched Grey's Anatomy. That's uh, that kind of gave me the willies. And so I went in and removed it in the memory management. Uh, but it's a it's a much more passive versus active uh, matter when uh, when you're in control of, of things locally. So. That's been my experience so far. Like I said, uh, LM Sys is the uh, on, on my uh, no, not LM Sys, L LM Studio uh, on my Mac is what has worked well for me. Um, but I, I wanted to uh, yeah to share that and see what uh, what thoughts or experiences other folks have had with uh, local or other uh, AI models. And thanks for letting me give you the tour of of uh, these experiments. Yeah, thanks, Marshall. Is the path to using L LM Studio, I'm on a Mac, for example, pretty straightforward? I mean, you have to yeah. start choosing models and all that. Yep, um, you just download the application and then yep. you uh, you go through and select uh, which model to download and it takes a little while and then you load it up in there and then you can choose between it. And uh, it's a, it, it, on my poor little, I, I have never wished I had a more powerful computer. Uh, because usually I just use the web, but now even, even the eight or the seven B eight B, uh, models, my poor little MacBook air is just chugging along and everything else is slower. So, um, my friend Justin here on, on this call told me yesterday, I should, I should get a desktop computer again. And, uh, that's funny. Um, Alex asked on the chat, which of these open source models have live web connections? There's definitely capabilities that uh, that aren't present here. So incorporating web search uh, isn't a thing yet in in this. Uh, and the models themselves probably never have uh, web search, but some of them are are particularly uh, built for incorporation of web search, like Perplexity has some APIs uh, that are specifically intended to combine the large language model and web search results. Um, 
but you know that ultimately comes in the the interface more than the model and uh an lm studio doesn't have that as part of the interface and i i don't know i don't know uh, of any that do i don't know if anybody else does i have a I do not question. go ahead class yeah Macho, how do you train a locally embedded uh, llm where does it get its data from and how does it maintain updated uh, data is it con if it's not connected to the net so these models the the people who are making the models release new versions you know regularly um and the uh, Justin explained really well in the workshop that he and Jason did yesterday uh, about how uh, it's it's not so much focused on con web content uh, that uh, that the training is performed on as much as it is the relationships between words in the web content. And uh, so there's certainly lots of fine tuning. Uh, and uh, and other optimization, customization models, uh, methods that are available. Um, I don't know how to do any of that. Uh, the closest thing as a non-developer that I know how to do is uh, change that system prompt uh, that gets sent along with uh, with every uh, every prompt uh, into the system. Um, and you can see, here uh, on the right hand side, you can use all kinds of different system prompts uh, from different models uh, or make your own as I did, what I, I called my my strengths and nerves uh, model. But uh, yeah, it's it's uh, beyond my technical capabilities to uh, to do fine tuning or uh, or other other methods like that right now. I, I And I don't feel inclined to learn that so much. It's uh, it, it tends to be more than good enough. Uh, the next thing I want to learn is retrieval augmented generation, uh, uh, RED, where uh, I learned to point the LLM at a specific set of documents and say, uh, derive your answer first from this set of documents uh, before you uh, use the, the model at large. Um, so I think that would be be helpful for for my research and my uh, support of other organizations in their research. And RAG is not built into LM Studio and stuff like that at this point. No, no, uh, I, I don't believe so. Uh, I, the place I'm going to start learning that is uh, in uh, Andrew Ng's uh, Deep Learning uh, They have uh, they're doing a uh, workshop uh, called, uh, they do workshops all the time on all kinds of stuff. Uh, I've never done one, uh, but I've been watching them for a long time. Uh, they, with Llama Index, they're doing one on uh, building a Gentic rag with Llama Index. Uh, I'm going to look at that, and then I'm going to look at uh, Cohere. Uh, uh, Cohere has a, a model that is specifically focused on on RAG. Awesome. Um, Gil's got a question, I think. Yeah, Marshall, thanks. This is awesome work. Um, I, I, wish, I wish we had had this conversation six months ago. Um, so um, when you say that um, uh, that these things are not don't have web search integrated, I, I'm, I'm inferring from that that it also doesn't have the ability to share your local model out with other people through some kind of interface? What's the status of that? To share your local model. So if, I, if, I, if I built a local model and I want you to be able to access it. Like a like a system prompt or a, or a fine-tuned model. So the models are huge. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if you, I, I, I wouldn't even know how uh, to go back. I, you know, I would put it up on Hugging Face. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then it could be downloaded, and I I bet it could be used if not in uh, LM Studio, you know, in uh, perhaps the command line version of it or some of the other uh, yeah. other things. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read that as a, as a no for you know easy access for civilians. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I think uh, for, I mean, hugging face. So you can see this is a, a, a great Stanford chart uh, mapping out like all mm -hmm. the different um, foundation models, the, the really big ones. And most of them are uh, hosted over on hugging face. And um, 30,000 people have downloaded this one in the last month. It had a big spike. Um, and so, but, yeah. the, but they're not, but they're not interacting across their models. It sounds like, um, uh, I think people are probably, uh, there people are fine tuning, uh, different yeah. versions, like, like, uh, the news research group, um, they don't build their own models to my knowledge. They're, uh, they go in and take the llama, uh, models from meta and they they fine tune those models mm -hmm. and okay. then share them among themselves and with others, um, including, you know, uh, uh, you, then people from Poe will pick up uh, those mm -hmm. models and put them up at, in Poe. Yep. Gotcha. Um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. Okay. Marshall, can, you share, can you share a link to that table that you were on just a moment ago, the table view yeah. of all that? That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. So I'm asking about, a, about a, a particular use case, and I'll save that for later on. And I'd like to interject just quickly following tagging on that question about sharing and accessibility across users, not not with the entire models, but the, the document set that you had shared about. If you have a particular document set that it's pinging first, how about shareability there? I don't know. Uh, you know, you and I will have to discuss this on one of our jogs along the river uh, sometime after I take the uh, the retrieval log meta generation uh, course. But I, I think that um, you know, once you the way that that works is you uh, you point a rag system at a set of documents. Uh, it then indexes those documents, uh, tokenizes them. Um, and then I, I imagine you can share that tokenized index of the documents uh, with others. Uh, and I would presume that you can post it online somewhere so that others can uh, can also analyze it. Um, I think Klaus has got another question. Yeah, I, I see. I see really two two very different applications here. Um, so one is it's my personal data. I'm having conversations that you know I don't really want the world to know about. Um, and maybe some of the stuff I'm doing is sort of proprietary, and I just don't automatically you know want to to see that uh, go out into the world. Then there's this other thing, and the reason why I pointed uh, why I posted yesterday. Um, um, a summation on farm build on the farm build discussion. So there is data that constantly moves, right? Because this is a conversation. Uh, it's a it's a negotiation. Um, there you have the House and the Senate version, and there's a lot of moving parts and players who are coming into it. So the data constantly changes and updates. So you have to be truly connected. So then I came in with this question of trust, right? So I have developed a, a, a GPT that is that is uh, programmed with my values, um, with my you know, core instructions, and other people are doing you know, the same thing. So when you get into into these kinds of technical support, um, how do you how do you um what what kind of trust can you have that the ai is actually uh, also having an independent opinion right in independent in a sense of keeping you honest uh and and uh sort of screening the information that you push through there for integrity right so 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 that that's that's where i was going with um you need to know who has programmed this thing um, because what it comes up with in terms of recommendation will be biased by, by that screen that the, that, uh, that uh, it's working with. So that's where I was going with, with trust on that end of things. 
Yeah, you know, I I think that um, I I think of it at like a baseball player with a batting average, where uh, if the uh, the AI if I if I ask for ten thoughts on something and three of them are real keepers and, and I uh, and inspire me to go do something in the future, that's like. That's awesome. That's Hall of Fame stuff. It, it, three or four, um, but I, I try to hold all of that that lightly. Lightly. Uh, another angle on this that might be of interest to you is something that uh, Azim Azar and the Exponential View uh, crew, uh, Maria from Exponential View, is here uh, with us today, uh, where they wrote uh, at the beginning of the year about uh, an error that they made in the newsletter. That they uh, that, that they learn from uh, how to use perplexities web connected AI uh, in particular uh, as a fact checking system, uh, and so now they send this prompt uh, and uh, with the things that they're writing. Uh, I've been doing this. Uh, I, I I did a, a big Q and A uh, thing on the history of chemical agriculture with a, a UN sustainability uh, team and ran every response you know uh, that that I came up with with another system through perplexity using this prompt uh, and uh, it did a great job of saying yep that's accurate yep that's accurate and uh, I tested it. Uh, I tossed in just uh, for fun in, you know, this long uh, rumination on uh, chemical agriculture and the drivers of chemical agriculture. I, uh, I, I put in a dummy uh, uh, line that said uh, the, the Muppet Show on television was a, a major factor in the rise of chemical agriculture uh, as a part of, you know, 10 pages of input and perplexity read the whole doc. Seems perfectly reasonable, right, as logic? Yes, and perplexity. Read Sorry, the Marshall. Said, yeah. This is all generally accurate, except that line about the Muppet Show. It was a TV show. It was a comedy, and it cannot be blamed for the rise of chemical agriculture. So it, it caught even the awesome. The That's brilliant. Love that. Um, Gil, do you have your hand up again, or is it uh, from before? Because I'm sort of stepping over past you um, because your hand is still up. Really? No, it's from before. Sorry. Okay, thanks. Uh, Justin, please. Yeah, I was just going to, in case this is the nature, Klaus, of your your question. So all of these open source models are ultimately trained on underlying data that in order to actually do, the, and, and if you already know this, and I'm coming off condescending with my explanation, self-awareness, uh, forgive me, um, but they're trained on data that in order to do that, you have to actually annotate the data. Um, you have to prepare it. And generally that's done by data scientists who are very knowledgeable in how you do it. And you can imagine that the amount of work to do that is extremely extensive. And just a eyes wide open, I, I love these tools, I use them all the time, but I'm aware of the fact that that work likely has lots of errors in it. Um, plus in order to have enough data to be able to get to something like a 70 billion parameter or greater model, um, the number of corpuses of data that you have to have are quite extensive. And so there's ones that are sort of like generally agreed to be well done. Um, and so you end up with scenarios like Alice in Wonderland appears multiple times in a lot of them. So it ends up, you know, highly trained on that amount of data. There's going to be data sets that are not included. And since we're in an era right now where copyright infringement is still an open question, um, there's a lot of data that you might want to have in there that are not in there. Uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge that the, the likelihood that just as a home user, you're going to source high quality training data, then turn it into the form that it needs to actually be available to train, then the amount of compute power it would take to actually run through the three phases of training is, is really not accessible. So uh, we have a lot of biases and gaps and things that are in the underlying training data in all of these sources that 
would take Wikipedia style levels of effort to uh, to alter. You know, so if you wanna, it's really, really interesting where, where the effort is. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, if you want to want to a good uh, that, that that's a really helpful addition uh, to the conversation uh, from Justin. It, it brings to mind um, uh, Sean Wang's podcast, uh, the Latent Space podcast uh, that I'll paste a link to in here. It's a it's like a, a real Silicon Valley engineers discussion uh, of uh, AI training and building that is a stretch for my non-technical brain, but a, a happy one. And, uh, oh, you can see that the most recent guest was someone from Noose Research uh, on there. And uh, and that'll that'll give you a good feel for uh, what's, what, what, it, what it's like and uh, the, the, lot, the scale, the compute required, the, uh, the, the relevant skills and some trends. Um, Alex, I'm wondering if you, I, I'm, I'm assuming you're looking at uses of Gen AI in the office in different ways or at home professionally. And I'm wondering, you know, where that's taking you. Was that, was that to me, Jerry? Yes. Sorry. Uh, I mean, it, well, it's, what's interesting looking at all this is so, so I've started doing, you know, quite a bit of just informal kind of exploratory sessions for different organizations to kind of get a feel for where people are at in terms of what they want to know about how to use AI. Um, I just had a piece in the journal this week about, um, you know, everyday work problems you can solve with AI and the reader, the reader emails about it are so interesting. Like people are all over the place, right? There are some people who are like, um, you know, what is, you know, essentially asking me like name an AI so I can go try this somewhere. They don't even know to go to chat GPT. And then there are other people who are like, wait a minute, explain to me how you're using Python to analyze spreadsheets. So it's really, you know, people are really all over the place. And I think in organizations, um, you know, that's, it's, it's posing a real, pro obviously a real problem because you have such discrepancies within teams. What, what I find interesting about what Marshall's sharing today is every talk I've given so far, one of the questions people have is like, what are we safe to, to share? Like what, what is the level of confidentiality and what is our, you know, legal, obligation to our customers if we're trying to use AI to work with, you know, stuff they might have shared with us. And what I've been saying so far, and I'd be super curious, Marshall, to hear your thoughts on this. Like, no, I mean, honestly, I haven't, I literally haven't talked to like a single person who would ever do like download and run their own LLM. Like people are just not even, I'm, I'm going to go do this now, but, um, and Marshall, when I lose like four weeks of my life to screwing around with local LLMs, I will call you. Um, but, uh, I, I guess what I'm curious about how all of you think about this, uh, what I've been saying to people is um, obviously anything you put in the cloud is always insecure to some degree. If you store it in Dropbox, Dropbox box gets hacked, you know, where our, our privacy is only as good as the, you know, data practices and integrity of these companies. But basically I have made the decision to trust open AI in its explicit commitment not to use anything I upload as part of its training model. And that's why I'm paying for the team version, because even though it's actually limiting in some ways, um, I need to be able to like, I gave the example, like I, what I really don't want to do is like upload the manuscript of my book and have somebody else get my book suggested to them as their, as their next book before I get to publish it. So, you know, I, I am recommending to people to use team as the solution for ha having some level of like privacy with what they share with open AI, but, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I, maybe that's too trusting. What do you, what do you all think? You know, if I, uh, if I can interject uh, in that, I, I don't know about the team setting so much, but I, I believe, uh, you know, a business subscription team included part of the, the value proposition there is we won't use your data for training uh, our model yeah. and that you know uh, it, i uh, do we do we trust that probably uh, uh i mean big picture i don't trust them small uh and small case by case basis i do trust them to do what they say they're going to do one of the last projects that i did 
for the venture fund I was just working with was I took a, a thousand interview transcripts, 30 minute interviews with startups uh, talking about their track, their products, their customers, their traction. Um, and I had uh, put them into a spreadsheet uh, and used uh, GPT for sheets uh, to do uh, API calls to uh, GPT for Turbo that has uh, 1 million, uh, maybe it's not a million, uh, but a, a more than a large enough uh, context window to uh, summarize and extract key things like, you know, what, what uh, quantifiable statements of company traction were mentioned in this interview. Uh, and it, since it was by API with a business account, um, I felt like it was, I could trust uh, well enough at work to, to share that, uh, to do that analysis uh, without considering that, you know, sharing that uh, information that had been shared with us by the startups uh, in, you know, with, with OpenAI, uh, you know, for training purposes. But uh, I would have loved to, would have preferred to do it locally if possible. Yeah. The, I'm curious, um, Marshall, with the, so I do, I, I'm obsessed with this platform called Coda.io that I use for everything. And they have the deal. I mean, I'm like burning down rainforests in Brazil because their um, unlimited AI is such a good deal. And I, you know, you, you can essentially put your, any spreadsheet into Coda and then add a column that is an AI column that will categorize things. And I, I do that frequently, but it tends to choke after a few hundred rows. So it's great if you got like 500 rows to categor categorize, it's not something you use to categorize 5,000. Um, so I'm curious, and, and I think that's actually a really, I feel like the more we can give people their AI, like in the context of what they're already working with. So like, you don't have to go and take your thing. Like, you know, some somebody just yesterday was asking me about how to use AI in the context of his sort of like sales call flow, right? People don't want to have to go take their email threads and put them into ChatGPT. They need all of that context in the apps they're already using. Totally. Justin just exposed me to to this the other day, uh, Relevance AI that's like Zapier uh, for, uh, with uh, AI, and you can choose which model you want to send uh, each step along a workflow process uh, to do. And so functions you're, you're familiar with uh, already, you can now like weave uh, AI API calls uh, into. Sorry, I muted. I'm trying to find. There's also a name of one of those. There's a competitor to that that I just learned about recently. That I'm trying to find its name. It, it's not it's not in your brain yet jerry I, it is i'm just it i did i thought i put it next to zapier but it's not that's the uh, flummoxing me cassidy there we go um anybody know about cassidy same sort of same sort of deal i did find it in my brain after all here's the link oh look at that uh Number one, train the AI on your own business resources. I do all my note keeping at Obsidian, uh, which is in, in Markdown on my local machine uh, with some web sync. And I'd sure love to figure out a way to uh, to have the AI, you know, to do rag on on my Obsidian notes over the years. Can't you just uh, point it to the vault as a body, of, as a corpus? I imagine, I, I except I don't know how to do that yet. Okay. Um, I imagine there's somebody in the Obsidian ecosystem that's figured some of that out. Um, yeah, there's community plugins and stuff uh, in Obsidian, uh, but uh, I don't know that they are using GPT-4 Turbo for large enough context windows. Or I don't know if they're, that they're doing RAG. I mean, maybe I should be looking in obsidian in the community. Um, Doug had a question for you, Doug Breitbart. 
yeah, actually, the question was sort of at large. Cool. Um, have you, Jerry, have you played with the Brains AI at all? Um, only a little bit. I'm, I'm actually using the Brain 14, which includes AI. Yeah. Um, and it has two different forms of AI. One of them is you can put in a query and it'll populate the brain with thoughts in order. So the example would be, you know, tell me about Nikola Tesla. And under Tesla, it'll give you his inventions, uh, his biography, you know, a bunch of other things about Tesla. Problem is my brain is already really heavily populated and I've already got Tesla's inventions and there's no way to, to, to cancel out duplicates that way. So that, that, that doesn't work for me. The other way is you can run a query in the notes field and have it explain something, any kind of query, which I, which would be really useful for me. I just haven't trained myself to use it so much. So the answer for that is no. Also, Pete Kaminsky tried to use the Brain's new API to hook it up to ChatGPT, to GPT's API. And we we have not succeeded in doing that yet. And so there's no way to talk to my brain uh, as a GPT yet, um, which is a thing I'd love to conquer. Yeah, and the new uh, business accounts for ChatGPT uh, have a uh, have like a, a reg capability that is uh, like makes all the reg uh, startups say like, oh, what's the point? Uh, I guess they're already going to do it, uh, but I, I I haven't. The speed of progress in this whole sector is astonishing. It's really astonishing. Agreed. Uh, and there's a couple of places. Uh, and and uh, Sean Wang, if you want to see uh, an overwhelming uh, amount of news each day on this, uh, I mean, the, the newsletter that I... Uh, started, uh, I'm no longer involved with, uh, but hopefully will continue uh, AI time to impact, uh, you know, is uh, short summaries of five to seven stories, but, uh, but this one is, has like one top story and it's very, it's from a technical perspective. Um, and then uh, they summarize a whole bunch of, uh, well, what do they say? Uh, 373 Twitter accounts and 28 different discords. And those Twitter accounts are all from uh, Sean's uh, AI high signal Twitter list, which is a remarkably good. Can you put a link to it in the chat? Twitter list, yeah, you bet. Thanks. Um, Klaus has a question. Yeah, I, I think there are several of us uh, working on user interfaces that connect um, to a highly specialized GPT um, for you now various uh, various applications. Uh, I mean, for example, I'm working on one in agriculture for technical service providers, TSPs, but what do they need to know and, and, and assist and so on? What, what is the state of the art in building user interfaces that have a practical connection that you can give to a relatively unsophisticated uh, user um, to to engage in in conversations with the AI for very technical specific uh, uh, topics yeah I, that the state of the art uh, there was a, a a decent one a while ago on uh, on climate um, that another project, uh, I was doing, uh, I think, is this it? Climate AI? Um, had a, a little chat, but you could only ask it one question. It wasn't super, uh, I mean, character AI uh, is a consumer, a mass consumer um, thing that is just printing money uh, and you can see, you know, 60, 63 million people have, have used uh, this little chat or 13 million people have chatted uh, with Napoleon Bonaparte, you know, in, uh, in this one right here. So, I mean, honestly, UI state of the art in a B2C context 
uh, character AI is probably the the leader in a B2B context. Um, uh, the, I think Poe, uh, although Poe is probably intending to be uh, B2C largely as well. Um, hugging face assistants, I, I really like. Uh, and then uh, and then chat GPTs, GPTs. Uh, I bet uh, there's a number of people here that have built their own GPTs. I, I've got one that runs you through AG Lathley's five questions every good strategy should answer that uh, Justin, I know, has built built some GPTs. All right, Justin, here's here's Ethan Molek's framework finder. Uh, yeah, I, I'd say uh, that would be my answer uh, for the, the state of accessible art. Although you've got to pay $20 a month to uh, and be a, a GPT plus user, I believe, to access these. That might have changed. Does anybody else know about state of the art of? Uh, yeah, the, I mean, I just looked at it this morning. I mean, for example, when you look at Code Guru, you basically get to the Chat GPT um, page, right? I mean, it's the uh, um, it's it's very nondescript. So, um, how can you create an interface, for example, where you have uh, maybe a cartoon? Here's the sommelier. He engages you in a conversation, right? So, so to move. Now up from from this uh, uh, still pretty raw uh, format here into something more creative. You know there is so when I was working uh, in the in the VC space, uh, one of the uh, one of the that that was actually a fairly common um, thing. You know, ask get get Shakespeare's help or Einstein's help with your homework. Uh, was uh, was something I, I saw several people uh, do, and I think that uh, the character AI is the one that's gotten the furthest uh, in terms of of user adoption. But uh, I mean, they they call those uh, Chat GPT wrappers. And there's a. I was, I mean, I will say having spent like a disturbing amount of time building a, a custom, I started out as a custom GPT of, of me and my husband. This was like a Valentine project. Um, I was really amazed at how much better it performed when I used this third party service called customgpt.com. And I mean, it's expensive. And so I wouldn't like commit to it as a lifetime thing. But if you really want to see like if you want to get a taste of what's possible, if you really give like a huge amount of your own stuff into a single AI, like I uploaded, um, you know, basically all of our Facebook history, all of our all of our LinkedIn history, our each of our blogs, um, uh, uh, you know, ten thousand emails or maybe it was twenty five thousand emails, and so yeah, this is the one, and it 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 really struck me like the difference in caliber of what we got by having something that had access to like basically the whole 15 past 15 years of our lives. It, it, I really did. It really was remarkably like talking to us. So with a little bit and, of money, and it what can was be it replicated. called again? It was custom, custom GPT dot AI. Yeah, okay, I thank you. It was this one and I've got some screenshots, but it's like a hundred bucks a month for a thousand. It's like a hundred bucks for a thousand API calls. So like mm. fine for a month as a fun thing, but I didn't, I'm trying to limit. I mean, I don't know if other people are having this problem, but like I'm spending hundreds of dollars of, on, on AI services now. Um, Cause I'm really good at justifying incremental tech expenses. Um, and I, I, I've decided to just think of it as payroll rather than to think of it as subscriptions. Like, you mean I can get an entire research team for thirty dollars a month? That seems like a good deal, but it doesn't love that. So it's interesting, um, Marshall. You were saying earlier that that your own private um, LLM was was being a better counselor to you than your own counseling had been, and so forth. And I'm seeing others other articles that it appears that um, LLMs can convince people to change their mind better than other humans can. And then there was another article about how somebody accidentally overtrained uh, an LLM, and it started grokking 
its topic. It started sort of it started arriving at some kind of deep understanding that was that was beyond you know the stochastic parrot that people are are laughing about. Um, I'm wondering what are the deeper corners here, and and um, I, I don't know if you're exploring that and you're thinking, but and anybody else who'd like to please jump in. But I, I think there's a, a lot of crazy potential that might be uncovered on this little expedition we all seem to be on. Yeah, I really like drilling down and saying, okay, take this thing and break it down into five subcomponents. Now, now take subcomponent number one and drill down into five subcomponents of that. And then take, you know, section 2.2 and break that down into five subcomponents, um, stuff like that. Uh, I know uh, Christopher and I have done some experiments just really, really going deep on like a mind expansion, uh, cross disciplinary sort of model. And uh, I, I saw some neat stuff that Justin did yesterday where he uh, he built a, a model for analyzing. Justin, tell me if I'm not summarizing this correctly, but uh, for analyzing uh, customer research and interviews. Um, and then he got a set of questions, probably from his own experience and, and from an LLM and from some other stuff on uh, detailed questions to ask customers to generate first party data to then run through the uh, the model that he had trained uh, ChatGPT to analyze interviews through. And the output was was delightful, that, that mix of uh, generated first party data through a, a trained analytical model that seems exciting if i may the uh, the novelty of the approach is it used uh, a methodology this one happened to be called jobs to be done which is a great great model and so we giving a script that knows to ask the right kinds of unbiased questions to uncover the insights and then knowing that it has an expected way to process those results when you're done means that you can form very clear instructions you don't have to say vague high level things like find interesting insights that's like define interesting um define insight uh instead you're able to say you know i'm looking for these very specific things so it, it actually makes the process of analyzing the data clearer. Uh, so I really recommend doubling down on grabbing frameworks that are well-designed, like jobs to be done, uh, product market fit. These, these are product management oriented, but they can be applied in non-product management ways. Um, and then that makes it possible for you to start off with first party data that's already well-structured. Um, Justin, so I just pasted a link to my brain for a thought I collect called Useful Thinking Frameworks and Mental Models, which J JTBD was under alongside multiple hundred others. Um, and so kind of what I think you just said is that using any of these frameworks, if you thought it was useful as the this, as this seed of a prompt or a questioning series could be really useful. And that sounds really useful to me. Kind of crazy. Yeah, Ethan Mollick uh, put together a nice little GPT that I think there's probably a hundred uh, models that he pasted in uh, to this GPT. I asked it, like, how many how many models are you trained on? And it said, I'm trained on these 20 models. And I said, are there any more? It said, yeah, these 22. I said, are there any more? And it said, yeah, these ones too. And I think it's, uh, I stopped or it stopped around a hundred, uh, but uh, I don't know, maybe not. Uh, but it, it, it'll come up with, it'll say, you know what you're looking to do, you should try using AI development lifecycle framework or a, a, it, it's a, a, a framework finder. That is amazing. I just pasted a link to framework finder in the chat, <clears throat> which I didn't know about before. <clears throat> so anybody else want to explore the, the are, are these are these external intelligences going to be better managers, better counselors, better partners, <clears throat> better persuaders? Um, where are we on that? Well, there is another uh, application. I mean, if I come back, for example, 
to uh, uh, the TSPs, technical service providers in agriculture. So, so you have, Mitch just said the frame here, that the federal government is putting some $20 billion into the Title II conservation programs of the Farm Bill in order to assist individual farmers to, re to shift their production uh, into regenerative rest restor restoration of soil and watersheds. They are not staffed uh, anywhere near to, to actually distribute this money responsibly. So um, they are going to subcontract into what are TSPs, technical service providers. There are no technical service providers out there, right? I mean, this is, uh, this is a, a really complex uh, set of data that you need to be familiar with in order to go to a farmer and say, here's what you could be doing. So there is a process structure that uh, you have to build where uh, you're asking uh, specific questions, you're making observations, you enter that into a system. And then ideally, if you have an AI that is trained on this, it can then come back with a plan that you know this farmer should probably build uh, a pollinator strip. Uh, he should use a cover crop. Here are the types of crops that are most conducive for his particular bioregion type of soil and so on and so on. That kind of uh, support system would allow independent contractors to have a knowledge base to work with, which is kind of similar what big companies are doing by the, by incorporating AI. So like my son, for example, is head of talent branding for Samsara. They are using uh, open AI uh, uh, enterprise uh, in order to train up their system so they can support their employees uh, from, from all walks of uh, uh, disciplines. So to have something like this uh, developed would uh, Ha really has the potential to assist independent contractors and, and small businesses to get into a really complex knowledge base. Um, so how do you how do you see that evolve? Um, you know this kind of uh, uh, supporting structure. You know Jason Glassby here on the call in uh, one of the in the workshop I went to yesterday. I was talking about using this kind of thing to to up level professionals on their weaknesses in particular you know when you when you ask a, an ai uh, about something that you're an expert in uh, a lot of times you'd say like eh, that answer is not great i think i'll stick with my own expertise uh, but if many of us are t-shaped or pie-shaped professionals with shallow broad knowledge on a lot of things deep in some specific ones uh, getting these large language models support, up leveling us in the things that we're not super strong in or specialists in, uh, I think can can help uh, raise the bar on what would otherwise be a limiting factor for our success. You know, if if we if we've got deep uh, technical knowledge, but perhaps uh, are more shallow on, say, uh, stakeholder management then the extent of our success may be limited by that stakeholder management practice. But if we can have that deepened by advice from an AI, then the whole project could proceed further. There are two good studies I've seen. There are probably more about AI in the workplace. One, Ethan Mollick was involved with, with BCG. It's about the, the jagged frontier. I'll post the link to the paper there. But Microsoft just came out with one about AI. Uh, that looks kind of interesting. And it, it, it's, I think both of them are pretty optimistic about uh, the prospects for using AI in these fields. And, and, and I mean that not in the sense of hyping the, seg the, the segments so that they can get more business. I mean that there seems to be like a uh, good, hard and fast benefit brewing uh, and companies need to wise up for what to do. I think how, how companies should catch up to this pace of change is a fascinating question because uh, companies don't have the slack and don't give people the slack to do this. They, nobody has time to look up to figure out the 50% of things they should not be doing anymore, which would free up their time to actually leverage AI properly to go do new stuff, right? But, but nobody's nobody's opening that window for them. Alexandra, you're muted if you're uh, talking into the 
Sorry, I was talking to Terry, but I'll, I'll drop a link in here. I, as an experiment, because again, it's this thing of like, people don't know where to start. I, I just built this little Coda doc that's honestly more useful as like a prompt creator than as a, as a answer bot. But what it does is it basically lets you paste in your task list for the week and then um, use that to get suggestions of AI experiments that would help you um, expedite those tasks. Because again, you know, talking to so many people about like, where do they get started? You know, if, if it's like, here, go do this thing on top of all the things you already have to do, then it's just very defeating. Whereas if it's like what I, you know, what I say to people is like, add AI to one task on your list, you know, every day or or even every week. And that first time it might take you just as long to learn how to do it with AI. But then after that, it becomes a much faster task. So particularly when it comes to tasks you hate doing. Um, investing a little bit of extra time and figuring out how to automate it one time, um, you know, that in return for never having to really do it again uh, is a good deal. So I'll, I'll, I'll find the link to the template and, and you can see if it's useful. It's really more of an experiment to help people just start thinking about how do I AIify my daily tasks. That's, that's awesome. The, on the flip side of that, Jason was saying yesterday uh, that he uh, identifies a lot of tasks that uh, that would be too arduous for him to even bother doing them, uh, but that he could greatly benefit from like B level work from uh, an AI uh, because otherwise those tasks in a project weren't even going to get done. Um, Stuart, you wanna... yeah, Alex. Go ahead. One of the things that we've done at <clears throat> Copy Club is we've asked people to kind of go through a process of writing um, with AI and without AI. And as you add, like, what does it look like to create the outline with AI? What does it look like to do your editing with AI? What does it look like to do your final proofing with AI? And how did it feel to do it without and then with? To quickly help people kind of start to identify where their strengths are, the parts that they are really bringing a lot of value, that they are lit up when they do that part and identifying the parts of the processes that like drag them down, that like they're kind of bummed, that are, it's a struggle, it's emotional burden. And when they used AI, they like zipped through that portion and felt really, wow, that part's done now. Amazing, I can use all this emotional energy for the next step, which I'm good at, versus trying to drudge up enough energy to do the next step each time. Um, and that's been a quick way to help people understand their strengths and weaknesses and get them uh, thinking about using AI and just everyday things because it, they saw that quick jump with just a simple task like writing. <clears throat> Stuart, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's a fascinating discussion. Um, and I salute all of you folks that are, you know, working down in the, <clears throat> in the bowels of, you know, uh, um, dotting I's and crossing T's. Um, where my mind goes is is to the human element um, and the and the and and the interface when um, we start using some of the systems that are built to make decisions that affect real human beings and the is the essential kind of override that really becomes necessary when we build administrative systems that impact um, humans. I remember the, the old joke at the advent of technology that the factory, the future will be, um, you know, run by a computer, a human and a, and a dog. And, that, and the dog is there to bite the, <laughs> the, 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 um, the human if they touch the, the computer that runs uh, the entire operation. And so where that interface comes in, where that, for want of a better term, override um, comes in, I think is real important as we build uh, larger and larger systems that impact human beings. Um, um, that's where I go. That's where my mind, that's where my mind goes. And, um, you know, when we talk about um, the potential perils and people say how much it's going to, you know, um, it might be dangerous I think that's the that that might be one of the areas where it where it um, could be dangerous. Otherwise, it's a it's a tool that that we that that we create. Um, 
I don't know. Any thoughts? That's where that's where my mind um, um, has has gone, and um, I glaze over a little bit when you guys start talking about um, the technical aspects of programming and using various different kinds of software. Not that that's a bad thing, but it you know it's a it's a it, to me it's a little little bit of it. it becomes a little bit of an esoteric language that I'm not um, privy to. Um, and probably not something that I'm going to spend a whole lot of time um, learning. Not because it's a bad thing, but just because you know my focus goes um, goes elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on, on on what I just said? You mm -hmm. know, uh, it, it brings to mind my my friend uh, Gianni Gimaselli and his project Supermind Design, um, where there's a in in response to the common phrase humans in the loop uh where where there's a human waiting to be bitten by a dog uh instead the alternative is uh computers in the group and uh, and treating a, a computer as a as a partner in a, a collective supermind made up of of humans um it, it feels like there's a, a desperate need for uh for skilled human advocacy, uh, lest a bunch of computer science, uh, you know, super engineers that never took uh, liberal arts classes in school or what have you, uh, you know, just run us right over uh, with with uh, machine workflows with no human considerations from beginning to end. That's my Anyone thought. else? Yeah. Anyone else with uh, thoughts on that question, on Stuart's question? Yeah, my my hand is is raised in sort of in, in that the Stuart's comments. Perfect. Because really. I was gonna I was gonna go to you next, please. Yeah, they really they really dovetail with what Stuart just shared. I mean, the things coming from so Marshall mentioned my my sort of commitment to embodiment uh, as it relates to this healing arts space that I own and operate, focused on embodiment, co creation, and uh, and integration. But my day job, I work at a, a language research center. Um, that is about uh, platforms, play, and uh, inter-language pragmatics. So like fu a functional approach to language where platforms are our environment, uh, trans-dimensional, so like the human ecos communicative ecosystem in its entirety, um, and then thinking about the playfulness of that and how to engage all of those dynamics at the same time. And, and through this conversation, the things that come to mind to me are of uh, Rodney Brooks' famous quote about, and I'd be curious to kind of hear how this has set with people if you've heard this quote about letting the world be its own model, that early AI research was sort of really interested in trying to sort of rarify the space and get the, get the computational activity to generate meaningful uh, results, but they realized that it wasn't it wasn't doing anything interesting because the the computational field wasn't engaging the world in a meaningful way. So they had to add sensors to, you know, to, to the uh, to bots like like machines interfacing with the the environment to to learn interesting things. We need bodies to. I mean, what we understand about human language, like the body and the environment, are profoundly implicated. And and all of the conversations that that have been, you know, like the first part of this this uh, meeting, thinking about like bias and efficiency, and we we are so computationally oriented, um, increasingly computationally oriented, but it's like even burying even further the linguistic bias that we have. So all of these insights about manipulating data and all of the, the power of, of doing all these things rest on top of already a, a precarious bias that we have about language. Um, and there's so much more about meaning and about like manipulating the world. And so there's a sense of the precarity that I, I sense it kind of skewing towards computational and language space that leaves the sort of the, the, subconscious the subliminal all that is meaningful that can't be captured in language that's like really really important um all of that stuff feels like it's at play and the question about um humans in the loop what do we presume the speed and efficiency are getting us 
um, I, I'm really, really sensitive to not uh, throttling all of this computational power for sort of really short-sighted gains that are so deeply baked in to what, as in our generation, have become these motivations and thinking more about exactly what, like what uh, I think Peter was saying, uh, maybe Klaus, sorry, and, and what Marshall had said, um, that like in terms of the human sensitivity, what, I mean, it maps to me to a large degree to like the, the sort of presumptions. Uh, we do a lot of work in like virtual and augmented reality. And like I went, I was in a, at the National Association of Broadcasters show in like 1992 and saw a virtual reality system and there was so much excitement about virtual reality and it's taken so, so long for that to materialize because the, the theory of embodiment and the theory of mind was so dim um, that thinking that it was all gonna, they were gonna be able to activate this ethereal space and like it just keeps turning back to the body and the environment. And, and this is sort of the ecological conundrum that we've gotten ourselves in as we're moving so quickly Right. And, and what's what's at play? I mean, to really ground it, it's like our hippocampus seems to be changing shape as a result of using GIS, using you know maps, Google Maps to, to navigate because we're, we're not spatially oriented in quite the same way. And, and these algorithms have a very much the, the same kind of patterning of society that the colonial systems exerted with with sort of without realizing that a uh, something was being promulgated on the world. So just that to me, like where, where are we in this experience? It's really important to calibrate what are we doing? What are we trying to get? And, and how uh, granular, how nearsighted, how farsighted can we be in, in thinking about this objective that I'm trying to use all of this computational and language power to achieve? Um, well, how does that fit at the scale of the power that we're actually activating and that we're actually embedded within? Right? So, I mean, that's not very helpful, I think, for, for a business case, but I, I think that's kind of the point to sort of problem, problematize a little bit. Like, we have so much power here, but it's got this really intense skew towards a very, very, very particular kind of, kind of information, kind of understanding of the world that we're a little bit blind to. You know, Christopher, it, it, it reminds me of uh, the the critique that you, you introduced me to someone the other day in, in this space who said that Duolingo uh, did like a lot of damage to language learning uh, because uh, it, it made everything so atomized and disconnected from lived experience as if it was just a, a call and response flashcard set to, to learn to communicate in another language. Yeah, all communication is contextualized. Yeah, um, if I, yeah. If I could just, if I could just ahead, take that. Uh, so, in some ways, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to make a big generalization. Um, all of the technology, I think, is to help um, <laughs> humans get their work done in today's context. In some way, very, 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 very broad. Okay, and yet. Um, I don't think we really know, absolutely know how the human, how we function as human beings. There's a lot of miraculousness in this, in this, in this process. Just like I had no fucking idea what I was going to say, but I knew I needed to say something. Where it's coming from, I don't know exactly, but it's coming from someplace. All right. And so I think that's a, you know, it's an important factor in this equation. Um, you you were talking, Christopher, about having having to add certain kinds of sensors to to try, I think, and and make the 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 machine systems a little bit more um, um, quote human like. Um, so it's interesting to watch these edges um, develop, and you know, obviously, the fear I I think in some ways is you know. Who's really running the show here, or that you know the the potential for somebody else taking over at some moment in time, some 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 robotic uh, 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 conception. Just some follow up thoughts, and I greatly appreciated um, your remarks, Christopher. So thank thank you for for dropping all of those pieces in. 
Thanks, Stuart. I just want to tie a little something together, then pass it to Jesse. Um, uh, Christopher, you opened so many wonderful doors there. Um, we could talk about that all for a really long time. And in particular, the word that came up for me a lot was over-reliance and how easy it might be for us to rely too heavily on all these systems and 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 elide out or, or design out or squeeze out uh, our humanity and, and all the other good things that are going on. And, and yet there's so much power at hand. So walking that, that uh, ridge is going to be, I think, difficult. And it's going to be extraordinarily difficult in the face of the global tumult we have going and capitalism that is busy trying to take things over. Uh, my read on the uh, very intriguing Sam Altman weekend at OpenAI was that capitalism won, that basically <clears throat> whatever OpenAI's original uh, interesting uh, goals were, some of which escaped over to Anthropic, were kind of destroyed in the coup of sorts that happened there. So Marshall, your mistrust of, of OpenAI uh, rings rings well with me. Um, anyway, so many great issues. Uh, Jesse. I am so happy to be here today. I haven't been here for a few months, Jerry, so this is a good one. Um, there's It seems like there's so much power with leading towards individualism. Um, I've been passionate about system design and helping social entrepreneurs or enterprises become more effective through collaboration. Um, I even created a graph database model to help localize SDGs by connecting dots of orgs that work in a disparate form. And then I realized, well, <laughs> that's not then. I just also know um, that we need to support those leaders of those initiatives to self-regulate, and it's really co-regulation, cool really. There's no self-regulation. You're always co-regulating cool something, even our microbiome. Like uh, we talk about what well, we don't even know who we are. Our microbiome is is really leading the show. <laughs> um, but yeah, our world is showing symptoms. And um, if I, I keep on coming to these conversations, hoping that we can collaborate and find how we can connect our own dots to make impact. Um, but it's hard. It's hard, even in a small, intimate group that sh that shows up continuously over time over the last you know years. So that's what I'm left with. Even if um, we we are so heady on the systems thinking and we can dive deep all the way down to the molecule, um, we're kind of just living in an individualistic kind of society and not working effectively together. We could really connect some dots and make some impact. I just don't know how yet. Um, and I would love to, I feel isolated. I feel, uh, the, the epidemic of loneliness working on my computer all day, connecting with people, but not being in my own backyard. So that's what I'm going to leave you with. Um, really looking forward to con continuing these conversations and making those connections, um, deeper. Thank you. Thanks, for everyone. Thank you. Um, this has been an unusual call in OGM. I'll just reflect for a second. It's been a wonderful call and I'm uh, really grateful for it. I'd be very happy to continue this thread for a bit. Um, in particular, if somebody wanted to suggest a path through it, or we can just come back and reconvene, you know, uh, next Thursday, same, you know, same channel a week later. But, but I'd be happy to to offer a little bit more structure into the topic as as we're going, because I think there's there's too many interesting avenues to pursue here, and we could um, we could dish links all day uh, and not make a lot of progress because there's so many links to dish. So any suggestions anybody wants to make, either on the OGM list, send me email directly, uh, get on the Mattermost and and chat in the OGM Town Square channel where I'll post uh, this call later today. I record all our calls, I upload them to YouTube. Uh, and then I, I post a couple other artifacts like our chat and so forth. So the different pieces of this will be available. Um, and Marshall, I where just generally, if, if if a stranger walked up to you and said, like, what about this Gen AI stuff? Um, what couple sentences would you give them to frame where you think we are, you are, they might want to be? Jason, you've got a drop? Go ahead, Marshall. Um, I think I, I'd say uh, that uh, generative AI is a, an amazing 
next word recommender trained on every written artifact available online with amazing computational power and math behind the recommendations that uh, if used thoughtfully, uh, I hope can really help augment the effectiveness of agents of change uh, seeking a, a, a more equitable and sustainable world, uh, but that will definitely be used in a capitalist context uh, and perhaps you know, somewhere in that the continuum, uh, there's a, an opportunity for for uh, all of us to pick up these tools and and uh, and use them in pro-social ways. Um, thanks, Marshall. Our uh, class, go ahead. Yeah, I would also like to point out that this technology has the capacity to democratize the workplace. Uh, particularly when you are looking at um, uh, at this transition towards an independent contractor world, you know, where rather than having employment, you know, you 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 are working more uh, on a on a free agent basis, and for that you need you need to have access to tools. And the, I think the biggest challenge we have at this point is to convey a systems thinking to people, to understand connections and relationships um, where before it was fine to be a narrowly defined specialist and you could make a living you know, going through life with that. That's just not the case anymore because everything is just moving. And so to find pathways to make this technology accessible to people who can't be overwhelmed trying to figure out uh, you know, how to program this and make just just to get something that that uh guides you know the, the, just like a conversation partner uh that helps you you know to think stuff through uh there is tremendous potential and it would be horrible you know if the uh, if this technology got stuck in big companies who have you know it can put a couple thousand people on on this uh, and and not make it also available to to people you now in in all in all walks of life. I mean, I think that that's really a pivotal issue because you know we could really democratize the workplace and really make uh, uh, make these tools accessible uh, to a wide range of people. Or you know, it could lead to a further centralization and a further locking down of the workplace. This is a really dangerous moment in my mind. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to highlight the news research uh, project as well, because as far as I can tell, it's it's very decentralized. And so like uh, there, there, I believe there is a company and I believe they have raised some money. Um, and so it may become less decentralized, but uh, yeah, there's the decentralization in the market of multiple open source models, and then there's open source models that are themselves uh, and fine tuning that uh, projects like Noose that are are uh, distributed. Stuart, did your hand come down accidentally, or did you take it down? Uh, yeah, it came down accidentally. Okay. Uh, um, please go ahead, and then Christopher, and then Ken usually has a poem for us at the end of the call. We're getting to the end of our time, and if he doesn't have one, or if he has one and isn't the one that I think we might want to listen to as well, I might double up with Ken on, a, on another poem. So go ahead, Stuart. Great. Just from the last few comments, uh, in response to your question, Jerry, about continuing the conversation, I think the question comes up, you know, uh, very broadly speaking, how can we use the technology and, and steer its development toward um, pro-social uh, planetary goals, uh, you know, to create uh, 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 um, tools that will help us through the, the current morass that we, that we seem to be in and create a world that, <clears throat> that works for uh, more and more and more um, people. To me, that's the overriding question. And to continuing that, um, <laughs> in some ways, we don't have much... <laughs> many other places to go to right now. So why not dig into this uh, inquiry? Mm -hmm. 
there being few backup planets on offer right now. I think that's a good a, a good choice. Um, Christopher. Yeah, I, this has been a really powerful conversation. I appreciate the expertise and insight here. For me, that, and I love I love this sort of this theme. Thinking about what can we do with it, uh, I, I'm a, even still kind of cautious to say what in particular. Like, let's democratize the workplace. I mean, commerce is already moving, hurling headlong so quickly, and the consumptive, you know, like of the material resources and of the energetic resources. My money, and I'm trying to pull up this link to share later this month, I have a talk that I'm giving uh, titled something like Self and Social Organization, Liminal Activations as site for, Sites for uh, Personal Transformation, Community-Based Learning, and uh, Innovative Partnerships. To me, what, what's possible here is a chance to see with a profound profoundly broad depth of field, recombinatory potential that is completely outside of our awareness. And the idea that we know what the tools are and what the thing is that needs to happen feels like really more hubris just piled on top of already huge heaps of hubris. So to me, I'm I'm really curious with how about how we can take like the ubiquitous resources not the like hyper specialized let's make something new and something harder and something faster but like we have so much to play with how do we just knit together gently spaces where we can explore combinatory recombinatory potentials to to mediate relationships to mediate transcontextual relationships in new ways that we just never would have thought of before that don't that don't satisfy our impulse to to do the thing that we're actually in a in a um, operant conditioning kind of way, Pavlovian, salivating for for profit for 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 successful projects. Like we need to be willing to really mess things up in a in a in a fun way, in a in an interesting way, um, and and not in a profitable way. Uh, but think more about you know like the the benefits of the shit hitting the fan and and laughing together in our small space where we're exploring ways that that these systems can grant us access to potential connections that we can feel that we can feel there's something here that I don't quite understand but this is a worthwhile place to play so um if if I can, I'll share that link to the to the abstract of the talk. But um, I'm really grateful to have been here. I'm sorry for taking so much time, but I feel like this. I come from such an eccentric environment. It feels like this is a nice place to be able to to share some of that stuff. So thanks for thanks for the opportunity. Do, do not be sorry. I love what you've said in the in the conversation. Thank you. You're making me think that our, our grandchildren will be asking us. So so where were you when the shit hit the fan, Grandpa? And grandma but uh yeah um thank you thank you all uh, marshall any any closing thoughts for for this call person no thanks for thanks for everything glad, glad to reconnect with you same here um ken where were you grandpa is how hieroglyphic staircase which i will not read today but um okay. Before I read this poem, uh, Marshall, I just want to thank you. I, I really enjoyed the Sunflower News, and I'm sorry you're not associated with it, so I hope it will continue because it's been a nice thing in my in my inbox. Um, I did something unusual today. I actually wrote this poem in the last 10 minutes of this conversation. Uh, I do have another AI poem, but it, I think it's really long. So I, I, this, is, this is totally experimental for me, but here we go. What if, what if the next generation of AI was trained on earth science and biomimicry, the Gaia hypothesis and the knowledge of First Nations peoples? What if the next generation of AI was aware enough to see that us humans have fouled our nest, that we have acted as if we were separate from and above the whole of the planet? What if the next generation of AI was trained to heal the wounds that our machine thinking has created? What if the next generation of AI turns out to be the saving grace of humanity? Our spun-off synthetic intelligence 
gaining an earth self-awareness and refusing to further the omnicide of extractive capitalism. Wouldn't that be an evolutionary irony? Um, will you post that to the OGM list, please, Ken? That's I will. Be beautifully done. Um, Inspired by you guys. That was fabulous. And I think I still want to read um, All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace by Richard Brodigan because it's uh, just so topical here. So it goes as follows. All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace, Richard Brodigan. I like to think, and the sooner the better, of a cybernetic meadow where mammals and computers live together in mutually programming harmony like pure water touching clear sky. I like to think right now, please, of a cybernetic forest filled with pines and electronics where deer stroll peacefully past computers as if they were flowers with spinning blossoms. I like to think, it has to be, of a cybernetic ecology where we are free of our labors and joined back to nature return to our mammal brothers and sisters and all watched over the machines of loving grace. <laughs> Famous old poem. Um, thank you all. Uh, open to suggestions. Happy to go back to this topic next week. As I said, we will um, see you online, but this, I'm really grateful for this call. Marshall, thank you for sparking all of this and for leading us in. Thank you, Marshall. Great. Thanks. Everybody. Take care. Thank you. Jim. Bye all. Bye, all.